I'm live. Awesome. So we're live. Got three people in the chat. So I'm going to let people start coming in. It looks like we got three people so far. Can you guys just uh, put a comment if you could hear me well um, and see me well? Uh, I just need some feedback because I can't hear myself or see myself. Well, I can see myself, but I don't know if I could hear myself. Let me actually pull up this chat. Perfect. What's up, Emmanuel from Healthy Tech, one of the best YouTubers in the game. So in this, I'm going to let people start coming in. Uh, we already got seven people, so that's super great. In this live stream, I really just want to guys, give you guys an update on what's going on with me so far in medical school. I just finished up my third week, and we're going to the fourth week. So I just want to give you guys an update on how things have been going for me, some of my study strategies, and just let it be a, a pretty much a chill, cool uh, Q and A. You guys can ask me anything you want. Interrupt me if you have any questions uh, along the way, and you know, pretty much just want to be a pretty pretty cool kickback and just allow you guys to ask any questions you want, um, find out more about you guys, and kind of see how medical school is for me so far. So that's pretty much it. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, Emmanuel, I'm definitely not the goat. I'm just getting started, but we'll, we'll, we'll both be, uh, at that 10 K very, very soon. So I have the, I have actually have the chat pulled up here. Um, and then I'm just going to be going through it. I'll also be going through how I kind of like organize my weeks in medical school. So today's Sunday and usually Sunday nights I'll go through and, uh, organize my OneNote, organize all my folders and my notes so that I have it ready for the week. And then I'll, uh, you know, then get organized and, and go through everything, kind of prep for the week, kind of ask myself, all right, what do I need to know? What do I need to um, prep for? Sometimes there's pre-work and some like, you know, pre-homework for certain labs and different things like that. So I'll go through that with you guys too uh, towards the end. But I really want to, um, you know, give you guys some uh, kind of like introspection. Jay, what's up? Welcome to the stream. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, you're applying to Sydney Kimmel. Any advice? So for Sydney Kimmel, it is definitely one of their biggest things is they really have a family oriented uh, vibe to it. And a lot of people are interested in uh, community service and just being super down to earth people. I think that's something that they look for in their pop in their, I guess, medical school population. Uh, because you're in Philadelphia, you're in an underserved area, you're, you're serving underserved um, some of the times. And they really look for people that love to be involved with the community. They look for people that love to, I guess, get involved um, outside of just medical school. So overall, I'd say, you know, be a gen genuinely like good person. And, uh, and show those, you know, well-roundedness uh, things in your application. And, and when you go to interview, uh, in my interview, I, I pretty much just sat down and went through my application. And, you know, I think they appreciated all the different aspects that I, I brought to the table. So just be yourself and show that you can do things other, outside of, you know, just being a medical student and just being like somebody that just like works hard in sciences. So that's probably my biggest advice. Get those secondaries in on time and just, you know, look up the school beforehand and, and kind of embrace all the different things that you might want to do. They have a very big program. Jeff Hope here. It was actually the first um, student-based or student-run clinic, a uh, free clinic uh, in the world. Um, so they really pride themselves on doing things like that, uh, underserved uh, patient care and innovation and and technology and research and all these different things. So just do your homework and, and you'll be you'll be straight. How many classes should I take as a pre-med while working full time? That's a great question. So I actually worked part time. I probably worked anywhere between 10 to 20, 10 to 15 hours a week. I'd say um, I was a personal trainer. So with personal training, you get flexible hours. You don't really have to clock into a job. So when you're working full time, 
you know, that's something I really give you kudos for doing because that's something that takes a lot of, lot of effort. Um, it really depends on your personal strengths and your personal weaknesses. If you feel like you could handle a lot of things, if you could feel like you could handle a lot of, um, you know, load, you're good at time management, you're good at prioritizing yourself. Um, you're good at balancing your, your schedule so that you can balance it with hard classes and not so hard classes. By all means, you could be full-time student, full-time working. Uh, but when it comes to being pre-med, you know, those grades are something that you don't want to sacrifice and you can't get those grades unless you are working and you're paying for the school. So I would, you know, take it slow if you have to, if you have to take a few extra semesters, I took uh, an extra semester before I graduated. I took a gap year, you know, med school is not going anywhere. So if you have to take extra time uh, to get to where you have to go and take it a little bit slower because you have to work, then all means, by all means do it. Don't feel rushed um, to get through it. So uh, that's probably my biggest advice. Um, if you if you're working full time, maybe try to take it slow. Uh, maybe dial it back and understand your strengths and weaknesses so that you can uh, maximize your grades while still being able to you know work and do everything you love. Salted lamp. What's up, King Zeph? Welcome to the stream. How would you suggest deciding how many and which med schools to apply to? So the that's a great question. Um, how many schools? So I, I essentially applied to schools. So initially I kind of had the idea, like they tell you apply to like, you know, the average is like 18 to 20 schools or something like that. I don't know the specifics, but they tell you to apply around that amount. I know people that apply to less. I know people that apply to way more. I applied to 20 because I felt that all 20 of the schools or 21 of the schools I was applying to, I wanted to go to. So that was the number one thing for me. I wanted to find schools that, yes, I want to apply broadly. You know, you want to give yourself the best op opportunity, but I zoned in on schools that I knew that if I submitted my secondary here, if I submitted my application here, if I got an interview, if I got accepted, I wanted to go to that school. So that should be your number one priority, applying to schools that you definitely want to go to, but also kind of see like, where do you, where do you fall? Do you, um, a lot of the times to get in the door, Unfortunately, it's the grade. So your GPA, your MCAT. Okay, so I have a certain GPA MCAT. Look on MSAR, the medical school admissions requirements, MSAR. Um, see where you fall as far as each school um, and then apply broadly. You know, don't limit yourself as far as, you know, some people just want to apply to top schools or they think they, you know, they go on SDN or something like that. And they're talking, you know, a bad about one school because, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, apply broadly and keep your options open. I truly... I applied to a lot of schools and there was a lot of schools that I may have not applied to if I kept my mind closed and I ended up going on interviews to those schools and really, really liking it. So apply broadly, understand where you kind of fall as far as um, the grades and then your extracurriculars and, and take it from there. I actually have a video on um, how to uh, or like what schools to apply to. So if you search that on my channel, um, it's probably named, I think, what schools you should you apply to or like how many schools you, you should you apply to? Uh, you can go check that out. And I, I think that, um, that that should answer your question. But that's a great question. Um, it's, it's really tough. I think it's, it's, it's just something that you have to um, decide where you fall as far as academically and then see where you want to go. I could have applied to 30 schools if I want to go across the country, but I applied to Northeast region schools so that limited me to like 20 schools, you know? And also schools that fit your theme as well. So put yourself as a priority first. Um, everyone says, don't focus on content, do questions, do questions, do questions. What advice would you give someone who did content and has gone through their Euro questions at full lengths are still low? What could it be? Content or strategy? That is, that's a good question. So I know exactly what you're talking about. A lot of people do say, do questions questions, questions. It's not about the content. I think that's true, but it's also false at the same time. Uh, when you're doing content, if you're doing just, if you're just doing practice questions and you don't know anything about like what you're doing, it's kind of like doing, um, if you ever do like flashcards or like do flashcards that somebody else made for you, right? You're spending more time learning and trying to memorize what the flashcards are. You're trying to figure out what the definitions are. You're trying to figure out uh, what specific words are. Then it, it, it doesn't actually result to learning. It just results to memorizing um, patterns and memorizing. And you don't want to do that. You want to be able to be in a situation where even if they stump you, even if they ask you something differently, because the MCAT will, 
Um, they'll ask you something differently in a different way each time. And you want to be able to adapt to that because you have the content knowledge and you know what you're dealing. If they disguise, you know, biochemistry in a certain way, you can always adapt and, and adjust to it. So I think the number one thing I took as a priority was uh, doing my content, understanding my content to a certain level. When I took my MCAT the first time, the reason I didn't do well was partially because I didn't do as many practice questions. But the main reason I think I wasn't, I was kind of sub 500 or 500 area was because I just didn't know my content well enough. I didn't know what certain uh, organic chemistry pathways were. If I saw an organic, I was, I, you would, you know, you probably feel the same way sometimes, you know, when you see an organic chemistry or a certain pathway or certain things that you're, you're weak in content wise, right? You see it and you get nervous immediately. Like your body just has like this subconscious nervousness to it. And when you, when you feel that it's because you don't know your content, but if you know your content, then it's like, all right, I know everything that has to do with this organic chemistry pathway. There's, they throwing it in a weird way, but I still recognize, all right, that's, that's like hydrolyzation or that's, you know, whatever it is. Um, so with, with each section, it's important to have that content down. The only section you can't really have content in is uh, cars. But with every section, if you maximize your content, I think that that would just help um, kind of like catalog and, and boost you up um, when it comes to your practice questions. If I didn't know my content when I was doing my practice questions, there's no point in practicing a skill. It's kind of like, you know, if you can't there's no point in like practicing how to do like a fancy layup if you can't do a, a regular layup or it, there's no point in practicing doing something fancy and getting good skill base or you don't know how the basic knowledge um, of, of, you know, your content. So I, I'd say for sure content first, maximize that as the best you can. And then, you know, go from there um, doing practice questions. Um, MCAT is a strategy strategy game. It is partially a strategy game, especially cars, especially getting your timing down. But if you don't have that foundation, you're, you're doing yourself a disservice in my opinion. King Zef. Uh, so what is your studying? What is your studying schedule? Uh, how do you keep balance between classes, recreation and study? Uh, that's a, that's a good question. So right now uh, I'll give you an update. Like we're in week three and or we just finished week three we're going into week four and i actually there's been a couple things i've been doing to balance i've been working out try to work out a couple of times a week um i i played actually played basketball yesterday with some of my classmates uh, we ran some four on four full court um so there's definitely things you could do to balance your life um it's all about i think medical school so far for me has been all about staying on top of your game if you stay on top of your game if you bust your tail during the week you could take it off a little bit. You could take your foot off the pedal a little bit in the weekends um, because you're up to speed. You know, fortunately, my school has weekly quizzes, so it kind of allows us to see, all right, where am I in my, um, you know, am I, am I behind? Am I up to speed? So if you're doing well in the quizzes, it kind of says, all right, you're up to speed. You're in good, good territory, right? Um, but there's still obviously work that you have to do and the, the things that you have to, you know, fill in the gaps with. But I think, you know, as far as balancing everything and, and doing my study schedule, I study pretty much every day uh, from it varies sometimes 7 a.m., sometimes 8 a.m., sometimes 9 a.m., whenever my lectures are, whenever my classes are. And then I go through the day, whether it's lectures or classes, and then I study pretty much until like 10, 11 o'clock uh, at night pretty much every day. Um, just staying on top of it, doing Anki flashcards, uh, watching lectures, uh, making Anki flashcards. Um, preparing for the next day, reading notes. So it's just a constant grind. But I think the biggest thing is finding that that time to, to have that balance. Um, but you're constantly, you know, with class being pretty much a guaranteed three to four hours every day, you lose that time to study, but you have to kind of, you know, balance it like that. That was a great question. Do you know if the Casper regarding, the Casper regarded as an important part of your SKMC? I have no idea, Jay. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> I know people that I, I literally didn't study for the Casper at all. Um, I did a little bit of preparation kind of like, uh, I, I completely forgot if I even had to send it into SKMC. Maybe they require it now, but I don't know if they required it when I applied. I have to go back and I, I'd maybe have to go back and confirm that. But for the other schools I applied to Casper with, um, I didn't really do much for it. I did like the 
the practice question, uh, the practice example that they give you uh, that you could practice with. And then I did um, just looked into some scenario based questions um, that I can, you know, can help me like get to where I need to be. Let me see. What else did I do for Casper? Um, I just I think I just looked up and kind of like use it as like a secondary almost like use your secondaries too um, because a lot of the Casper questions are kind of like secondary. Uh, what's been a challenge in your life? What would you do in this situation? It's all about like thinking on your feet and being quick. So I think practicing, if you're not good at thinking on your feet and being quick and you're worried about making the wrong decision um, and making, you know, thoughtful decisions, then I would, you know, practice those questions and look up examples, but I don't know how much it, it's weighted. Um, that's a great question. And I think that's a question that a lot of people were, are uncertain about. If you go online, there's really, nobody really knows what um, the weight is for that. Uh, would you suggest taking the MCAT multiple times or postponing the first MCAT until you feel ready? I would say <laughs> it's so tough because I took mine twice and like even taking my MCAT twice, it, it opened up like a, uh, a, another lane for me. So if I didn't take my MCAT twice, so let's say I took my MCAT in 2018 and I ended up getting into medical school that year. I got the score I wanted. I got into medical school, whatever. Then I wouldn't been able. I wouldn't have been able to do the gap year position I just did, uh, which gave me amazing experience. I wouldn't have been able to take another year to kind of like ease off the pedal and appreciate what I'm about to do in medical school. So there's so many things that not doing well on the on the MCAT did for me. So I wouldn't change what I did. But if I were to do it all like over again, I probably would have taken another year to, or maybe at least that summer, to prepare. Um, more for the MCAT and, and just take it once. Um, taking it twice and preparing for it twice was probably one of the worst experiences. The second time I took, I prepared for it. I went harder and even more hardcore than I did the first time. I was literally studying like 50 to 60 hours a week um, MCAT stuff. I wasn't doing anything else. I wasn't working. I was doing a little bit of research, but yeah, it was, it was just like the craziest grind. And I remember when I was opening books for the second time, I was getting like PTSD of like, oh man, I have to do this again. So if I were to tell you, just do it one time, um, do the do the MCAT one time, take it when you're ready. You'll know when you're ready because your practice test will tell you and you'll be consistently getting scores uh, correctly. I, when I was doing the MCAT for the first time, I, um, you know, before my MCAT, I was getting like 504s, um, 500s, 502. So I knew I was going to land around 500, 504 um, if I was lucky. Uh, so I would just say, take it one time. You'll know based on those AAMC practice tests, um, when you're ready. That's a great question. Uh, how does studying for med school compare to undergrad MCAT studying anonymous? Appreciate you joining the chat. Anonymous is an OG. Um, so studying for med school versus undergrad. So undergrad, you could literally just go to class let's say you're, 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 you have 10 weeks worth of material for like a midterm or whatever. Let's say you have like, not 10 weeks, so that's like a semester, but let's say you have like four weeks or five weeks worth of material uh, for four or five weeks for, and then you have a test, right? You could literally go to class and not do any additional studying. Just literally go to class, absorb the material, do like the man mandatory requirements. You could do that and then you can get to your test date let's say a week and a half, 10 days out and start studying from the beginning and then, you know, ace your test, you know, 10 days out, seven days out. With med school, you literally have to study every single day because the amount of content and material you're getting is literally like in a week, it's worth like a semester worth of material. Um, I remember uh, one of the doctors that's kind of like a mentor for me, he told me how in a semester of college, you have like a five subject uh, or like a five inch binder of material you have to know, to know with medical school, you get literally like, it's like a five inch binder of material you have to know every single week. So it's all about conquering the week for me. And it's all about kind of like, you know, staying on top of everything. So studying every single day, uh, not taking a day off, um, unless it's like a weekend, sometimes I take like a, a weekend day off or like I'll go light or just do like, you know, flashcards or something, but it's pretty much just, it's more, it's more relatable to how I studied for my MCAT uh, the second time where I was literally just studying every single day, all day. But this one's a little bit different because the, what you're studying and how I'm studying, you know, when I was studying for the MCAT, it was strictly just like sitting down with the material, 
doing the practice questions and putting in the putting in the work. But with medical school, you're learning in all these different ways. You're learning with cases. You're learning with uh, small group stuff. You're learning anatomy. You're learning clinical skills. You're learning a uh, traditional way with just lectures and stuff like that. So the learning is different and you're um, definitely learning in different ways, which allows you to kind of mold the information better. So you don't necessarily have to necessarily like sit down and study as much. Um, but I don't know, I'd say, I'd say it's a lot different just because you have to study every day and the grind just like constantly is a constant, constant grind. Uh, a few weeks into med school, how is life and school treating you? Tom Conwell, my boy, uh, my boy's back home. Uh, miss you guys for sure. Um, med school, life, uh, it's a good, it's interesting because you sign up for medical school and you, you say like, you know, this is what I want. I want to be a doctor. And you, so you can't really complain when stuff is like really, really hard when you're getting stressed out or you're overwhelmed from the first week. So you can't really complain and you just have to taste it and you have to be like, you know, just take it on the chin and eat the punches and eat the grind because you signed up for it. This is what you signed up for. This is what you, you know, you can't complain. I, I see people that complain all the time and, you know, nothing against those people, but you literally signed up for medical school. What did you expect? You know, you think you thought this was going to be easy. Like everybody tells you that it's, it's hard. So you, you, I knew what I was expecting coming through. And so that, that means I can't really complain about it. And I just try to have that positive mentality because I, I, I feel like if I complain about medical school being hard or, or the, the material being too much or the professors being bad or whatever, it's just doing myself a disservice. I'm just putting myself in a position, you know, of vulnerability. And, and, and I don't think it just helps me at all. Um, I like to just kind of attack things head on, but I think it's been great. Um, overall, it's been really exciting getting to actually learn what, um, all the science that you've been accumulating over the years, what it actually means as far as treating a patient, everything that we do, a lot of the times it's associated with how we take care of patients, how we can improve patients. Uh, if you guys watch my, um, office tour video, you saw the, the poster that I have on my, above my desk here. It says study like your patient's lives are depending on it. And that's truly kind of how you should be going about it. You know, when you're studying for undergrad or MCAT, you're just studying because you have to get this grade. You know, you may be passionate about a couple of different classes, but you're really just trying to study so you could get into medical school. Um, when you're studying in medical school, it's so that you can help save somebody's life one day, hopefully. Um, so everything I'm studying uh, for, and it's just a different, it's just a different grind. What's up, Sean? Welcome to the stream, my man. Uh, yeah, so it's just a, it's just a different grind. And when you're, you know, I really just em embrace everything. So I embrace the fact that it's hard. I embrace the fact that it's overwhelming and you just, and you just gotta, you know, really love it. I think, um, if you have a, a negative mindset and you're kind of like, what was me in medical school? There's so many people that wish they, they could be here. So there's no, nothing to really complain about. So life's good, man. As future would say, uh, what do you do for self care while in med school? And when, you just want to have fun outside of medical school. Joel, thank you for your question. Uh, Joel, you, you're, uh, you've been subscribed to me for a long time since I was probably at like sub 100. So I appreciate you for, for sticking with me. Um, that's amazing. Uh, so what do I do for self-care? So I mentioned before, I, I like to exercise a couple of times a week. Me and my girlfriend will do like at-home workouts. I think the gyms in Philadelphia are open, but um, I don't know if I'm ready to risk it, <laughs> risk it yet. And my school's gym is actually closed, I think, for the year. So I just like to exercise um, for fun, just, just kind of keep me balanced. I played basketball yesterday. I actually played basketball the week before that. Um, so just doing things like that. It's really hard um, right now. And that's really the hardest part. I don't really know my classmates because we all have to be social distance. I know my um, case-based learning group because we see each other in person. Uh, social distance, you know, twice a week. So I know about nine people <laughs> in my class, but um, the fact is I don't really know anybody. So it's hard to socialize. There's some people that, you know, do more socializing than I do uh, so far, but I, I talk to a lot of people and we just don't really know our class like that because um, we weren't able to have our traditional orientation where we can meet and, and really get to know everybody. So that's been like really the hardest part about doing quarantine and social distance medical school. You don't really get to know your class that well. Um, but for me personally, I just like to, you know, play sports, work out, 
um, do YouTube. You know, these are all the things that I like to do kind of like for self care. I'll listen to a lot of podcasts. I'm trying to get into listening to more audio books. Um, maybe I'll get into uh, riding bikes around the city. One of my uh, CBL group, uh, case based case based learning group members was t telling me about how he uh, has a, a bunch of bike trails and a bunch of different um, you know bike uh, routes uh, throughout the city. So I might hop on on that too. But my bike is is not ideal for long distance biking. So that's a great question. Uh, what's up, entitled dreamer? How's been the adjustment? How's the adjustment been to med school uh, with the time commitment required? Do you feel the drinking water from the fire hydrant analogy? Absolutely. Um, that is was one of the first realizations I had, and I literally smiled when I felt that feeling because uh, when I was in the first week, you 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 feel it right away. There's no like warm up. There's no kind of like syllable syllabus week. Um, our syllabus week was orientation, where we just sat through a bunch of lectures of them telling us about the school, what to expect. And then literally the first day out, you feel it like the fire hydrant analogy, the 80 page slides and, you know, all the notes and all the things. Um, it's important. That's why I said it's important in the way that my curriculum is structured. It's kind of like a week. If you if you successfully complete the week and you complete at every day and you and you overcome every day and you su successfully win in that week um, with the quizzes and, and the different affirmations that you can get. Um, it's, it's very easy to use as a snowball effect into the block exams that are at the end of every like five, four or five weeks, five to six weeks. So that's what I've been really trying to do. Um, yes, it's definitely drinking water out of the fire hydrant, but eventually I guess, you know, for the sake of the analogy, you're, you're able to take in more, uh, you, you're able to build kind of that stamina over time. Um, it's definitely hard though. Cause even on Sundays, like even on the weekends, I'm thinking like, Oh, I have to go do another week of this constant work every single day and it does definitely does get uh, exhausting but that's why you know like joel asked you know what do i do for self-care i think it's even more important to have that balance you know on the weekends or even during the week things that you could do and the good thing also about having things online though is you can a lot of the lectures are pre-recorded and a lot of the stuff is you know kind of segmented in a certain way. So you could really take advantage. If you want to go hard in the weekend, bust out, like that's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to take care of two lectures that I have on Monday. So I really only have one lecture on Monday. Then I have to do an anatomy dissection, a virtual anatomy dissection. So instead of having three hours with a class I would have to do, plus the three hours with an anatomy dissection, I'm only going to have one hour worth of class. And then I'll have my three hours with the anatomy dissection, but I could use my other time uh, to do the certain things that I want to do to to get ahead of the schedule. Um, so those are some things that you can do to really adjust um, and and make drinking out of that fire hydrant a little bit more bearable. How many people are in your class? What is the average age? Uh, I don't know the average age. I think it's anywhere between twenty three and twenty four. Um, I think. I think that's what they gave us for, um, for um, the statistics for last year. So I think it's usually around that area, 23, 24. Um, there's some people that in my class, there's one person in my CBL group, he just turned 21. There's people that um, go through uh, an accelerated joint program. So they have joint programs with, I think, Penn State uh, mainly. And the, you basically do three years in undergrad and then you your fourth year is technically your first year of medical school. So some people haven't even gotten their degrees yet. Um, and they're uh, first year medical students. And once they get their degree, they, once they finish their first year, they're officially like graduated up from undergrad. So it's pretty crazy stuff. Um, but it ranges from the people that do that and then people that take multiple, multiple gap years. So everybody's different. And it's really interesting to, uh, to, see, the, to, to see the balance and the variation. I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I took about a year and a half off. Um, but my class size is actually very big. Um, most medical school class, I feel like it's like any between 80 and 120, um, 120 might even be high. My class is 270. Don't ask me how it's manageable or why it's that big, but it is. And I've been told in the past that like, even with 270, you get to see like, and meet all of your classmates. So it's unfortunate that we can't meet each other with, uh, social distancing and everything that's going on right now, but it's, it's a large class. And, um, I guess it's a good thing. The positive to that is you always have, I guess there's a wide a variety of people that you can choose from to like get to know and connect with. 
Um, they have a lot of faculty and staff to support us, which is amazing. Um, and I think it's, it's also good because you have you could have the opportunity to build a lot of uh, long term connections. I was talking to one of my mentors yesterday on the phone and he was saying how, you know, your first year, the people that you go to medical school with, you're going to be calling them years and years later into your practice, you know, asking them for help and asking for recommendations, different things like that. He actually uh, recommended my grandpa to one of his classmates um, who is a neurologist. He's an orthopedic surgeon, uh, but he was a he was he recommended to my grandfather to a neurologist. So it's just it's just all these different connections you can make. So I guess having 270 in your class is um, is clutch. But also it's a lot. So I don't know. Um, I need to start mentally preparing myself now. There's really nothing you could do to mentally prepare yourself for what for what's going to happen. You can't do it. Um, I tried. The best thing you could do to mentally prepare yourself is to actually prepare yourself, as in looking into different resources, looking into Anki, looking into how you can potentially um, schedule yourself. Uh, that'll help you kind of jump in a little bit easier. I think I had a little bit easier time jumping in because I did so much research, whether that was YouTube or um, other resources that kind of helped me. My, my, the second year students here actually put together uh, a video telling us about all the external resources and how they use it and what you know we could potentially use it for and when we should use it and the recommendations. So that was something I use and kind of like studying the external resources and how I can prepare myself. And that's what made it a little bit easier for me to get started. But overall, it's, it's definitely um it gets it gets tough um there's nothing there's nothing you could do to control uh or mentally prepare yourself you just have to have fun uh have fun and enjoy it uh a lot of my classes are still live however watching recording seems ideal especially yeah one and a half and two times speed so i even watch mine sometimes on two and a half speed because two and a half speed um if you start your lectures on two and a half speed you can uh, cut it down to 2.0 speed. Uh, so quick backstory. I, uh, the lectures in my undergrad were recorded too. So a lot of the times for how I pre prepared for my tests were just re-watching re a lot of the recordings. Um, so what I did was I watched everything on two times speed. So I'm used to hearing it. I watch a lot of podcasts and a lot of uh, different things, YouTube videos even on two times speed just to save time. I'm just used to it. So sometimes I'll watch it on two and a half speed and then cut it down to two to make it a little bit easier for me to catch stuff and to, and to type along with it. So yeah, so two, one and a half, two times speed with the recorded lectures, super clutch. I think the first couple weeks of med school or the, at least the first week and a half, uh, we had a lot of like live lectures. So now it looks like we're getting a little bit more pre-recorded, which has been really good because I can do them ahead of time. I could watch them on one and a half times speed, two times speed, and I don't have to worry about going to them live. So um, that that is the the benefit of of, of yeah, two, two and a half times speed. Try it out. Um, you won't you won't regret it. I think once you train your ear to get that two and a half, it just makes it it just makes it a lot easier. It's it's a it's a double edged sword because sometimes I end up rewinding more if I just were to and wasting time versus if I. Uh, just uh, watch it at one, like, let's say I watched it at 1.0 speed, it would have taken me an hour to do. I watched it at 2.5 speed or 2.0 speed, and I'm just ending up rewinding it. So am I really saving that much time? I don't know. Um, do you have any scholarship or financial advice for paying for school? Uh, definitely apply for as many scholarships as you can. Um, I was fortunate enough to receive a scholarship to go to the school that I'm going to now, but I still have some debts because I have to pay for... Um, you know, living. Uh, so I have to take out loans to pay for living, but my uh, tuition uh, is taken care of for me, fortunately. Um, but if you have the opportunity for paying for it, you know, I saved up a lot. So a lot of the furniture uh, in my apartment is, I mean, all pretty much all the furniture I had to pay for out of pocket. I used none of my loans to pay for the, to like furnish my apartment. Uh, I just saved up a lot when I was working in during my gap year. So if you have to work, take a couple of gap years, work, save up some money, to minimize your loans, 100%, I would recommend um, getting as many scholarships. You don't have to just apply for scholarships through your school. Um, a lot of times they're merit-based or sometimes most of the times they're need-based. Um, so if you're not a need-based student, then just you know continue to you know work and then try to apply for external scholarships to help reduce your costs. Um, that's not something I'm very, very familiar with because uh, I was fortunate enough to not have to go through that process. 
but it's something that's out there and I was already looking into a little bit before I, I received my scholarship. So uh, fortunately, I didn't have to go through that, but I know a lot of people are struggling um, and that's one of the biggest struggles with medical school. Uh, so this is a question unrelated to med school, but where's the one place in the world you'd like to visit? So I've actually been pretty decently traveled. Um, my parents love to travel. So I've gone to a lot of different countries. Uh, my, my dad's actually from Jamaica. So I've been to Jamaica once. My mom's from Panama. So I've been to Panama a couple of times um, as well. We traveled on like cruises and stuff to, you know, the Bahamas, Bermuda, um, a bunch of different islands. And I've been to Mexico. I went to Mexico last summer. Um, I've been to pretty much every state along the East Coast. I actually went to um, Vegas last uh, around Labor Day last year. So about a year from now, actually, or close to a year from now. So I've been to a decent amount of places. I haven't been to California yet. That's one place I kind of want to go. Uh, but if I had to choose like one like place that, that's on the top of my list, somewhere in Europe, I haven't been across overseas yet to Europe. And I'm really looking forward to doing something like that because I think that that's when you're getting to like another world. When you're going to like Europe and you're going to Asia and, you know, I think I actually might want to go to the Philippines um, because two of my, uh, like one of my closest friends growing up in high school, we played basketball together, Chris um, and his brother Kyle, I'm, I'm close with as well. And, and their whole family I'm close with. Um, but he's from the Philippines and they went to the Philippines, I think last summer or earlier this year in March. And it was so beautiful I, that might be my number one, next place, the Philippines or like somewhere in Europe, um, for sure. Yeah, definitely want to come through to uh, California. Um, I don't want to give away where you're going to school, but I'll come through <laughs> to your area um, and, uh, and kick it for sure. Yeah, uh, one and a half speed is even too fast. You get used to it um, for sure. You get used to it. Uh, going on one and a half speed is, is going to be light work. It's going to feel like it's slow. Everybody I talk to, they they always say I started on two. I do two and a half everything two and a half speed now, and the one speed just sounds like they're talking in slow motion. But a lot of the professors they kind of uh, they talk slow for us to comprehend and understand. Um, but when you're trying to save time, efficiency efficiency is key. Great questions. Still have some people in the chat. I appreciate you guys for coming through because I was a little bit nervous that nobody was going to show up to my live stream. And I thought I was going to be here by myself, just like sitting here with my fingers, you know, twirling my fingers. So I'm really happy that you guys pull up to the live stream. I uh, came to support the kid. Um, I'm just really, I'm not really doing anything right now. I'm taking a break. I was just actually reviewing some of my week three. Uh, lectures, study questions. I was doing a bunch of Anki earlier today, uh, so I'm just I'm just trying to uh, take uh, everything with a in stride. Couldn't wait for the stream. Appreciate you, man. How do you schedule your study periods, dude? It's a day to day process. Um, it really depends. I really studied. A lot of people say put in your study breaks first. I never do that. Um, I always tell people to do that, but I never take that actual advice. I don't know why but I just find it hard to like put my breaks in. I've definitely put my breaks in, but I can't like put a block of like where I want to take my break. I feel like my break is designed and should be designed based off of my workload um, so that I could have a good workflow throughout the day. So how do I study my, my study periods is essentially depending on how I, I've been trying to wake up actually earlier than my lectures um, to get a, uh, like a steamroll or like a momentum for the day before I actually have that first lecture. So because my lectures are recorded, they usually start at 9 a.m. Let's say like tomorrow my lecture is going to be at 9 a.m. and it's going to be live, but they're going to post a recording of it at 10 when it's over. So that means I'm not starting my lectures until 10 because I'm not watching it live. I'd rather watch it, uh, the recording, and then watch it on two times speed and then do my Anki at the same time uh, or make Anki cards for that at the same time. So if I were to wake up at 9.45 to, to do that at 10, it would just be, I would just be wasting the time. So I'll probably wake up at like six, uh, get, you know, get my day started, start at seven, maybe watch a lecture or um, something like that beforehand and then kind of get some momentum 
throughout the day and then take a break after maybe a couple of lectures. I like to schedule like 15 minute breaks after I do like a long period of, of time. So let's say I'm working for like 90 minutes doing a lecture. Um, I'll take like a 15 to 20 minute break after that and then I'll get back into it. So small periodic breaks throughout the day and then big breaks like a 30 minute to 45 minute break for lunch. Uh, usually a big break during dinner time just to spend time uh, eating dinner, kind of like relaxing before I hit that, that second leg and after dinner. Um, and kind of find things that I, uh, do things I enjoy essentially. Uh, what's up? I are Herman. What's up? Welcome to the stream. Hey bro. Hope you're doing good question. What made you take a gap year and what did you do? That's a great question. So I, I kind of mentioned this before. So, uh, somebody had asked me the question, how many would you take the MCAT twice or would you take it one time when you're ready? And I said, how? The reason me not doing well in my MCAT for the first time was literally destiny because it allowed me to it allowed me to do what I did in my gap year, which I did clinical research at an orthopedic practice uh, on Long Island where I live. And the interesting part about it is it's an orthopedic private practice. So usually when you think about clinical research, you're thinking about like a hospital or at like a university. And this is actually a private practice that ran and did a lot of research and put out a lot of research in top orthopedic hand surgery journals. So I did uh, hand surgery and upper extremity. Um, so it's interesting because the funding from that for that research, you know, as a private practice, you can't really fund a guy like me to do research. It's just another employee. You can't really fund to pay for certain things. So he, the, the owner of the practice actually owns a surgical instrumentation company uh, called AM Surgical. And basically uh, he has, he's super involved and he loves technology. He loves innovation and he creates and engineers and his son and his family, um, they create and engineer surgical instrumentation for orthopedic surgeons. Um, so not only was I able to kind of see uh, obviously do orthopedic research and clinical research. But I was also able to see the engineering side of medicine, the integration between what surgeons look for in their instrumentation, the engineers, what the engineers are trying to do. Engineers are just problem solvers. So they're constantly trying to work and try to figure out what's the best. So it was a, an amazing experience. Um, so that the AM surgical company, I was an employee for kind of like an intern for them. And I was also a clinical research coordinator uh, a team of one at the orthopedic practice. So I was, you know, do orthopedic, uh, research every single day. If they asked me to run errands, if they asked me to do, um, help them out with something, you know, I, it's constant, um, back and forth. So I'm a man of many talents in this position, but, uh, not doing well. My MCAT opened up that amazing opportunity for me. Um, I would say take a gap year if you can, because it gives you that real world experience. I don't think a lot of people that I've been talking to, even with my class, and in my, in my experience, and a lot of people may not have gotten my experience because it is unique and especially crafted. Um, but even with that being said, you know, I, a lot of people in my class don't have a lot of maybe real world experience if you are coming straight out of college, right? Um, you may have like some experiences in undergrad and it, it definitely varies, but just being able to take a time off, um, focus on yourself. I did a lot of stuff. I played flag football. I went to the gym. Uh, consistently for like the first time in four years because I always had school. So I had to like switch up my gym schedule. I went to the gym consistently. I felt great. I spent more time with friends and family. I could devote myself to like doing everything. I traveled all, all, all over the Northeast region for interviews. So just being able to do what I actually love to do for a year and embrace like um, other side of why I want to go into medicine, which is like actually experiencing what it's like to work in a, in a doctor's office um, doing clinical research, doing all these things that are your passions, being able to create a YouTube channel. If I didn't take a gap year, I would not have made this YouTube channel. I could guarantee you that because I would not have had time. Uh, so having the downtime to just be creative and do yourself um, is was clutch. And uh, even having, you know, my experience was something that I, I'll never uh, forget. And I'll never take for granted, you know, the people that I was able to meet um, the connections I was able to make with my with my job, and it's even it's beyond like getting publications and just a real life experience, and it was something I'll never I'll never take for granted. So, uh, gap year I highly recommend. Like Emmanuel said, he took great three gap years, best time of his life. Like if I were to take another gap year, I probably would have spent time doing more traveling and stuff. But um, I was pretty much ready. Like by the time I had my first gap year, or by the time I got to like that end of that gap year. Um, last year I was, I was ready. I was ready to go to medical school. Um, I was hyped up. Um, 
Any early predictions on specialties? I know you mentioned following Dr. Webb. Do you have a future orthopod? Do we have a future orthopod in the making? Ramon or Raymond? Uh, Ramon, I think, Brown. Uh, I definitely am interested in orthopedics um, for a couple reasons. So I interested, I interestingly enough, I wanted to go into medicine because I was interested in sports med. Um, I es essentially was like, in high school, what do I want to do with my life? Hmm, I'm interested in sports. I'm an athlete and I kind of like medicine. So let me look into sports medicine. And I essentially looked into sports medicine, looked into different jobs I could do. I was like, oh, I could be a sports physician. I could just be a sports med doc. Um, I didn't really know what that knew what that was at the time. I didn't know that you had to like be an orthopedic uh, surgeon and then you had to go through your five years of residency and then your fellowship, whatever. Um, but I just like, oh yeah, I could be an orthopedic, you know, sports med, uh, physician. And I actually went into um, undergrad as an athletic training major. So as an athletic training major, you're really focused on sports industry and in, uh, sports injuries, um, sports medicine. So that was something that that's where my love for medicine kind of grew and kind of blossomed. Um, I actually even got questions on my interviews like, you know, what if orthopedics doesn't work out for you? You know, I, I have an open mind um, in what I want to do, but my love for medicine came from sports medicine. It came from wanting to heal athletes and helping athletes recover. Um, just being able to use your hands as an orthopedic surgeon, I found, you know, just being able to use your hands and see somebody pre-op and then see somebody, seeing somebody post-op, it's, it's, it's day and night and being able to sit in an operating room for an hour and be able to physically change somebody's life versus like giving them a medication. I think, you know, doing it with their hands is just another level of gratification. So I think I'm definitely gravi gravitating towards uh, orthopod, being an orthopod. Um, Dr. Webb is one of my, one of my biggest orth inspirations. Um, you know, just seeing his story and following him for years uh, during my undergrad times when I was going through the process um, has definitely pushed me, has definitely inspired me to make this YouTube channel. So I can't thank him enough. But uh, yeah, I, I'm interested in ortho. I did ortho research uh, at a couple of different places. I shadowed all orthopedic surgeons. I didn't really shadow in any other field. Um, so that's my biased opinion. <laughs> that's my biased opinion. Um, orthopedics is one of the best fields, I think, um, because of the ability, you know, surgery in general, just to be able to use your hands to change somebody's life is, is huge. I can't remember if you said it already, but what podcasts do you do you enjoy listening to? So I, I, I have a wide variety. So podcasts. Um, so my podcast, uh, I could actually pull it up on my phone here. I have my phone in my hand. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm looking down. Um, so my podcasts definitely vary. Um, with, with me, I like to, I, like if I want to get education on something, if I want to learn about something, I usually don't listen to it in podcast form. I like to usually listen, use my podcast as like sometimes educational, but most of the time like enjoyment and like to make me laugh or to kind of ease the tension. Um, so I listen to Joe Budden's podcast. He is hilarious to me. His the, the dynamic they have on that podcast. Uh, I love music. I love hip hop. So they talk about a lot of music, hip hop related uh, news and, and uh, music that comes out. And I just love the dynamic of those three or four guys on that podcast. So I listen to them religiously. I listen to um, uh, one of the podcasts I listen to that's kind of like motivational, uh, Secrets to Success by CJ. And let's see the full name, CJ and Eric Thomas. Um, if you guys know Eric Thomas, ET, he's like a motivational speaker. If you probably heard him, like, if you don't want to, if you got to love it as much as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. Like that's that guy. Um, so he has like, they have a really, um, motivational podcast. They talk about a lot of like grown men talk and like, you kind of like, like to listen to stuff like that to like keep your, your mind mature. Uh, I also listen to a brilliant idiots podcast. So that's another like joke one, like kind of like ease the, the stress. Um, Charlemagne, the God and Andrew Schultz. Uh, comedian Andrew Schultz and you know Charlemagne, um, legendary uh, radio personality. Just listening to them go back and forth, kind of like a joking, uh, like immature podcast that you just listen to 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 kind of ease the stress. Um, another podcast I like to listen to is one by uh, my good buddy uh, Anthony Amen, Health and Fitness Redefined. So I know Anthony from uh, five years ago. Um, he hired me as a personal trainer. And I've been building a relationship with him ever since. Great guy. I actually released a video with him today uh, talking about how doctors can help change the fitness industry. 
So I listen to his podcast. He, he puts out motivational speeches. He talks to different fitness personalities. I was actually on his podcast too. So if you dig deep, I think, uh, I forget, I think episode four, you could listen to, to my, to my episode. Um, that's another one I listened to. Uh, oh, the ortho show. So I got, I recently started listening to the ortho show. It's by, um, what's his name? What's his name? Um, the ortho show, Dr. Scott Sigmund. He is, um, Dr. Scott Sigmund. He is an orthopedic surgeon. He's like known to, uh, to be like an or opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon. And he has great episodes. He brings on orthopedics again, like I'm biased for orthopedics. Um, so it's, it's like one of those situations where he brings on different people and they talk about, about different things in orthopedics. So I like listening to that. There's another podcast, PJF podcast. Um, so I, I'm, I told you guys, I'm interested in like sports performance. I did personal training. So I'm really interested in sports performance and biomechanics. So sometimes I listen to stuff like that just to get for my personal, like urge to still be in that kind of field. Uh, so PGF podcast, he is a basketball strength and conditioning coach and trainer. Um, he focuses mainly on basketball, but he does, you know, all different athletes and he's super knowledgeable. Everything he does is like evidence-based scientific base he breaks down research articles so it's super cool um i love that podcast and then a last a last one i, I listened to it for a, to a little bit um pull up with cj mccollum um he talks basketball cj mccollum is like one of my favorite person uh in the league because he's just like a chill dude he's just like a regular dude um and, and he has a podcast too so and he talks about you know basketball and and, and life stuff too so uh those are my podcasts sorry long list i listen to a lot of podcasts i listen to more but uh, yeah, those are the main ones that I listen to for sure. Oh, I also listened to, well, I was on me and my cousin, uh, King Zeph. He might not be in the stream anymore, but, um, we actually did a podcast. If you go on his channel, they're called podcast Sundays. We talk about different things. We talk about black lives matter. We talked about just regular stuff, YouTube. Um, there's so much stuff. So, uh, if you want to listen to me kind of like on a, on a podcast, go listen to the podcast Sunday, King Zeph. Uh, K I N G Z E P H, and you could and you could check and you check out uh, me on the podcast as well. I thought about starting up my own podcast, but it's kind of like my 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 podcast episodes. I recently graduated, and I had planned to apply, but with COVID, haven't been able to get to take an MCAT, so that's my biggest concern. But that being said, I've been thinking, so that's leaning towards getting more life experience. Definitely do it, man. Get more life experience. Don't rush it, man. I, I said to somebody else earlier. Med school is always, always, always going to be there. It's not going anywhere. It's going to be there for the end of the eternity. So don't rush and try to get in. Whatever your parents are saying, whatever your friends are saying, ignore that and just focus on your own goal. Focus on your own mission. You'll get there right away, right when you're supposed to. 100% agree. Immediate gratification and being able to have direct and tangible impact on patients. Big fan of Dr. Webb. Absolutely. Um, hopefully you'll get to operate on a case together one day. That would be pretty sick. Uh, not going to lie. If I got to operate with Dr. Webb, um, that would be awesome. Um, there's a lot of people that I'd love to operate with or you just even be in the OR with and see how they think. Um, the OR is one of my favorite places to be. I spent my birthday last year in the OR. It was on a Friday and the doctor I was working with um, did surgery on Friday. So I was like, I'm spending my birthday in the OR because I just love the energy. Um, people are seem to be always be so nice um, and and you get to learn a lot and you're really like in the middle of changing lives. So check out my friend's channel. If you haven't already, she just started med school this year too. Chris on meds. I feel like I've seen Chris on meds. Let me search YouTube real quick for that. Sorry guys. So <clears throat> you guys don't know this about me, but there's only a certain amount of people that I follow on YouTube because sometimes, oh, sorry. Uh, so sometimes I'll definitely check her out. I feel like I've definitely seen her videos before. She looks like she's doing very, very well on YouTube. That's amazing. Um, yeah. So I don't really like to watch too many YouTubers because I don't like, sometimes I feel weird. Like I feel like I'm stealing people's ideas. Um, even though it's like an original idea I had, if somebody else puts out a video before me, I'm like, oh, somebody else is subscribed to me. Sometimes subscribe to them. Like I think I'm stealing their ideas, stealing their thumbnails, stealing their titles. 
So I just try to kind of like isolate myself. I kind of got that from Andrew Schultz. He told me how like he said on like podcasts how he never listens to any other comedians. He doesn't listen to comedy because he doesn't want to feel like he's stealing other people's content and ideas. So I don't listen to or watch really anybody else. I li- I watch a few people, uh, select people uh, on YouTube that are med school YouTubers, but for the most part, I don't I don't really watch uh, that many people just because I don't feel like I'm gonna uh, steal. Pe- I don't want to steal people's ideas, man. I don't want to feel like I'm like uh, cheating cheating the system. And it's also like a mental thing. Like you you see everybody else their numbers. You see you know it's just you don't I don't I just don't like to compare myself. You know sometimes I'll check out a video if it comes up on my thing, but um, I don't like to like religiously watch people because I feel like I'm stealing their 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 ideas. <clears throat> uh, what did your school allow? When did your school allow you to start going to clinic and things like that? Um, so we're actually doing like half. We're doing like a sorry. We're doing like a hybrid um, situation right now. So right now we're doing. Um, small groups and clinical skills stuff in person, social distance and and whatnot. And then lectures are all online. Uh, We're actually not allowed to go into the clinic at all. Uh, We're not allowed to shadow right now because it's it's specifically for the fourth years and the people doing the third year rotation. So it's kind of sucks because that's one thing I was looking forward to getting into. But we'll see when it opens up. We'll see when things kind of like, you know, settle down. I, I hope, really hope we progress forward very, very soon. I'm not a med school student and don't intend to be one, but I'm very much interested in how med school students are being taught to be culturally competent. I work with so many white peers going to medical school who have no cultural humility and play the system well that they'll become our community's health workers. So I was wonder. How your school is helping you with those aspects. That loops T, that is probably the biggest and most important question that I've gotten in the stream. No shade to anybody else. But that is a great question because you are asking a question that is directly relevant to not only why I'm inspired to be a doctor, but also why a lot of Oh, I'm inspired to be, make this channel and push people forward is because I want to give an opportunity for people that may not have a, the perception even to themselves and put themselves in a box and say, I'm not what a doctor should be. I'm not, I don't fit the category of what a doctor should be. A doctor is just a white male, white female, whatever the case may be. You know, all my doctors growing up, my pediatrician, she was a white woman, I believe a white or Hispanic woman. Um, but I didn't see myself as a doctor um, because I didn't see doctors that looked like me. So having doctors out there that look like you, it not only helps people of color um, feel comfortable when they're getting treatment, but also allows us to, like you said, have that cultural competence, have that understanding. And one of the biggest things is I think the reason, one of the reasons I came to the school is because there's no really, you can't get away from it, right? You could kind of hide from the fact that like, you know, you could, you could, Turn a blind eye if you if you live in an area that isn't um, you know culturally diverse. But being in in Philly, there's no way to escape it. You're going to be seeing culturally diverse patients from all races, all ethnicities. You're going to be uh, in the thick of it. And if they didn't if they didn't teach us how to deal with that, or not deal, but if they didn't teach us how to manage and be culturally competent. Um, there's no way that you could be a successful medical school in a city that's fifty percent. Get, you know, 50, essentially 50% black, 50% everything else. Um, so it's really, really important um, that my school is on top of that. And it's been something that's been pushed already. I've had multiple lectures on race and medicine, uh, cultural competency, um, and different things like that. We, we actually have a block or a class that we take that's a longitudinal class um, every single week that we learn about different elements. We talked about anti-vaxxers. Um, we talked about race and medicine a week before we talk about uh, cultural competency and decision making and understanding your biases. So there's so many things that my school is actively doing and it's built into the curriculum. Um, I'm taking a humanities selective uh, on race and medicine as well. And, you know, most of my class is white. So I assume if that class is full, that most of my counter, most of the people in that class are going to be white, but it is definitely something that it's easy to turn a blind eye to. And it's also easy to learn the cultural competency um, and not actually feel it. You know, you feel, you, you learn the rules of like 
this is what you should know, this is what you should apply, this is how you should do it. And you do it as a, in like in a textbook machinery form, but you don't actually feel it until you actually treat a patient. Uh, you don't actually feel it until you get it out into the community. So that's another thing that I was saying. A lot of people that come to the school, I think Jay asked earlier, a lot of people come to the school, uh, have interest in community service, have interest in getting out in the community. Um, they're not just here to be bougie. They're not here to be med students. They're actually here to get in the mix and get their hands dirty. And that's something I appreciate with a lot of the people in my class. So that's how you teach it truly. Um, you teach it in the classroom, but you also teach it by having people in your class that go out and get in and get, get in the mix and learn it firsthand how to deal with it. And and the second part of that is is gaining cultural awareness and cultural competency within the medical school by having in uh, more diverse patient, uh, di not diverse patient, diverse medical school population to where there are more black students, there are more Hispanic and uh, Latinx students and more Asian students to help um, everybody else understand and have that combativeness of like somebody has one opinion. All right, this is actually how it is, or this is how, actually how you should be thinking um, because it's so easy to just put people in a box if you don't have somebody to check you. So uh, that was a great question. And, and like uh, Herm, uh, Herman said, or Ernan said, um, you know, real, that's definitely a real question. Um, so yeah, for sure. It's, it's so hard too, because you don't necessarily know. It's so hard because like I said, you could teach it and you would put it in the curriculum. Somebody could study it to get an A on the exam. But does that necessarily mean that when nobody's looking, they're going to be culturally competent, culturally aware? You hope. You hope it's something that's ingrained, but it's really hard to teach and ingrain that. So um, it's just a first step in the right direction. I think uh, diversity in, in physicians is the, is the next step. Or uh, you know, coexisting step. All right, so seven o'clock. If you guys have any last questions uh, before I log off here, I want to kind of keep it short because I do have other stuff I have to do. But if you have any other questions, please ask them because I am very. Uh, happy to to answer them. It's been really great. It, this hour is really like it. The hour went by so quick. I didn't even realize. Um, you guys asked like so many amazing questions. I just want to make sure I didn't miss any. I think I asked everyone. I'm also going to be posting this live stream afterwards. So if anybody um, wants to kind of like watch back the earlier questions, uh, feel free. Um, so I'm going to be posting, posting the live stream. Looking forward to the next stream. Thank you, man or woman. I don't know if you're a man or woman, uh, but thank you. Um, I'll probably try to do one every other week. I don't know if every week is feasible uh, because I do get pretty busy. And I think in a couple of weeks, I'm going to have my first full uh, first exam week. Um, so I don't know if every every week, but every other week. We'll see. Oh, okay. I actually know how to pronounce that name because that's my uh, late grandfather's name, Enon, in Spanish. Yeah, sorry. I just Americanized your name, but I know how to pronounce it because my, my grandma used to uh, yell his name all the time. Rest in peace. Thank you. I really love how you're tackling all of that. Yeah, it's tough, man. It's tough because you gotta uh, you gotta balance life, and it's hard because you you want to focus on a lot of the different things, but um, sometimes you just gotta focus on one step at a time and and getting over that one hurdle. Um, but my biggest thing with this channel is just trying to integrate and trying to you know get people together that appreciate. Um, different things, and we could all grow because that's the only way to do it. Last question, what are you looking forward to in 2021? Hopefully, I'm getting to do anatomy lab. 
Um, so I'm hoping in the springtime they actually have like lab anatomy dissections open. I'm really looking forward to doing that. We have to do virtual dissections, unfortunately. Um, so I'm looking forward to doing anatomy lab as far as medical school, as far as non-medical school, getting to travel. You know, hopefully after my first year, I get to travel and get to, uh, you know, spend some time just on vacation. I'm looking forward to potentially my summer next year. If I have any interesting or cool, like research stuff lined up or experiences lined up. Um, but 2021 is going to be pretty, pretty crazy. Um, I always say like every single year is going to be the best year ever. So <laughs> I'm just hoping that 2021 is the best year ever. 2020 is still the best year ever because look what we're doing right now. You know, we're in medical school, a thousand subscribers plus on YouTube. Um, so, so it's the best year ever. ever. I'm, I'm healthy. Um, luckily, my family's healthy. So for me so far, I, I can't I can't. Um, I can't say it's been a, a bad year, regardless of everything that's going on. It's traumatic. Um, it's saddening. It's disheartening. Uh, but it's still, you know, we're pushing forward. We're getting closer to our goals. You guys are welcome. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. Uh, I know you're pretty busy yourselves. So I'm, I'm, I thank you all for tuning in. Looking forward to the next one as well. Thank you, Joel. I appreciate that. Take care. All right, everyone. Thank you for tuning in again. Uh, about to cut off the stream. Any last questions? But thank you so much. Um, I appreciate everybody that came through to the live stream. Even if you didn't ask a question, if you just watched, I appreciate you for coming through. Um, this has been really great for me, just getting to connect with you guys some more, answer your guys' questions, um, hopefully give you a little bit of introspective and some perspective on what it's like to be a medical student, just a regular dude in medical school. Um, anybody could do it as long as you just work hard and the opportunities are there for you to grab. Um, so thank you again for watching. Uh, if you guys have any suggestions on anything, feel free to put, the, put it in the comment section in this live stream when it goes up. Um, if you have any interests or questions, you wanna do some mentoring or you wanna set up some level of mentorship with me, I'm super open to that as well. Um, just send me an email. My email is, I'll put it in the, the chat, uh, but send me an email. Uh, if you are interested in like, you know, talking more or getting some mentorship or something like that, I'm happy to guide you guys, uh, personally along, along your journey. Um, that's one of the things I'm, I'm in this for, you know, I made the YouTube channel because I want to uh, mentor people and I want to uh, help people out. So if you want to get more interactive, um, feel free to reach out to me uh, via email and we'll get something going. So, but thank you guys for watching. Good luck, everybody. And let's get it. See you guys later.